Well, hello uh, from wherever we find you today. Um, we have a very interesting panel here over the next hour. Uh, and I'd like to uh, briefly introduce the panelists, uh, three of whom will be uh, on the screen. So we'll have a conversation. Uh, the fourth uh, was unable to uh, attend by way of video, but um, Ms. Markovic uh, from, the, uh, from the Council of Europe, uh, and she is the Director General of Democracy there, uh, has agreed to participate by, by way of a video. So let me uh, first introduce uh, her video, and then we'll come back to the uh, panelists in our conversation. Uh, Dear ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted uh, to greet you in this uh, virtual edition uh, of uh, Securing Sport. Let me start by congratulating the International uh, Center for Sport uh, Security for its uh, contribution to the promotion of uh, security at sport events. Conferences like uh, Securing Sport are an important resource for both uh, national and international policymakers, since uh, they uh, provide us with the precious opportunity for multi-sectoral uh, reflection, dialogue, and most importantly, action. The security of major sporting events uh, uh, should indeed be a key objective in any sport policy. The Council of Europe has always been at the forefront in promotion of safe, inclusive and ethical sports. In um, 1985, uh, our Convention on Spectator Violence uh, became the first treaty to focus on measures to prevent and to respond to violence at sports events. Uh, this convention was negotiated in um, record time as a, a reaction to, to the Hazel Stadium disaster, where 39 people died and uh, 600 uh, were injured in May uh, uh, 1985. Since, since then, our work with public authorities and sport organizations have allowed us to go beyond the initial objective, namely to guarantee the security of sport events, uh, uh, to uh, um, integrate uh, uh, two other important dimensions of, uh, of our approach, uh, safety and service. The evolution is now reflected in our most recent uh, convention, the Saint-Denis Convention, uh, on an integrated safety, security and service approach at football matches, matches and other sport events. Now counting 18 uh, state, uh, state parties. The convention captures years of lessons learned and good practices uh, from Europe and beyond. It provides uh, uh, precise guidance, encouraging uh, the participation of many stakeholders in the design uh, of uh, action plans and of strategies. For national and local authorities, uh, uh, sport organizations, uh, events organizers, and fan clubs. Implementing the saint -Denis Convention uh, is the right and the smart thing to do. It is a way to better promote, to protect and, uh, and respect the human rights and, of course, fundamental freedoms of all participants in sport events. It is also a way uh, to plan events uh, uh, that will bring many benefits and uh, leave uh, long-lasting uh, legacies uh, uh, for hosting nations. By, by ratifying the convention, states uh, um, from all continents can fully benefit uh, uh, from the opportunities offered uh, by a focused, need-based and result-oriented international cooperation. In this regard, uh, I would very much like uh, uh, to applaud uh, the efforts uh, of the United Nations Office uh, of Counterterrorism, uh, the UN, uh, UN Alliance uh, of Civilizations, uh, the International uh, Center for Sports Security, and the United Nations uh, Interregional uh, inter Crime and Justice Research Institute, all present in this policy dialogue. 
I warmly welcome the development of a guide on major sporting events uh, for policymakers. And uh, I appreciate the invitation for the Council of Europe uh, to contribute uh, with its uh, expertise. The promotion of a wide range uh, of legal instruments, uh, principles and standards, such as the one developed uh, uh, within the Council of Europe, will no doubt inspire countries across the world to improve their legislation, their policies and practice. In a constantly uh, uh, changing and globalized world, we need to increasingly look at the security and the legacy of major sporting events uh, from, I would say, macro perspective. This is particularly important in times of crisis, such as the one we live in. The Council of Europe is more than eager to keep working with all relevant stakeholders in this common effort to ensure safer, more secure and more welcoming sport events across Europe and, of course, beyond. Let me finish by wishing you all a very successful conference and uh, take care, stay safe. Well, so that video by uh, by Ms. Markovich really serves as an excellent introduction to uh, to this panel. Uh, uh, what I took from uh, from her comments and from the mission of ICSS is that we are to explore the potential of major sporting events as a model for international cooperation. So, it's major sporting events could perhaps serve as a microcosm uh, for how we bridge divides that normally separate us, national divides, ethnic divides, religious divides, uh, regional divides. And if we can bridge those divides by way of small examples, like major sporting events, then maybe there's something to be learned on a bigger scale. Um, major sporting events uh, have certain qualities uh, that maybe uh, could be promoted internationally. Um, they feature competition fairly uh, under a structure of rules. Major sporting events obviously fear, feature sportsmanship uh, and mutual respect for participants. And, and because they serve as such a powerful model for international cooperation, uh, I think major sporting events actually uh, are ex exemplify a common good, something we can use to bridge the divides. So this panel's design um, with a uh, just a terrific group of experts uh, to explore this question about what can we learn from major sporting events and can they be applied in a broader uh, policy arena. Uh, let me briefly introduce the three panelists and then uh, we'll turn to a series of questions. Uh, first up is, uh, is Dr. Vladimir uh, Varankov, uh, the uh, UN Undersecretary General uh, who runs the uh, Office of Counterterrorism uh, at the UN. Uh, next up, is Miss uh, Theodora or Dora uh, Bakayanis uh, from uh, Greece. Uh, and she was of course the uh, mayor of uh, Athens uh, during the 2004 Olympics. And then third, Miss Antonia uh, Marie de Mayo, uh, who is the director of the UN uh, Interregional Crime and Justice Research Institute. Um, and she joins us from Italy today. So um, the three panelists, I think, provide a broad um, array of expertise to address this question of uh, security of major sporting events and the potential to use them as a model uh, for international cooperation. So let me turn first to, um, to Vladimir. Um, Vladimir, your office, the um, UN Office of Counterterrorism, is currently leading with others the development of an international policy framework regarding the security of major sporting events. Could you briefly describe that and, and reflect on the potential that this model or this, this framework could serve as a broader model? Douglas, thank you very much for this question. We are proud to lead the United Nations Global Program on Security of Major Sporting Events 
and promotion of sport and its values as a tool to prevent violent extremism, in which uh, uniquely uh, United Nations Alliance of Civilization, CITED, and ICSS are key partners. The program addresses the needs to protect major sporting events, which we see as a common goal of the international community and opportunity to promote dialogue across countries and cultures. We are working to provide guidance and technical assistance to member states organizing important sporting events. Next month, our team will finalize a United Nations Global Guide on the security of major sporting events, which was developed with the help of experts from security and law enforcement agencies, international and national sport federations, municipalities, the private sector, and technology companies involved in the security of major sporting events. This guide will provide decision makers with policy level tools that reflects current best practices, including with regard to public private partnerships. So it will be a significant step forward to get together different experiences and to present to the public opinion and decision makers the main ideas how to make this work in a perfect manner. Over to you. Thanks. Let me let me turn uh, to uh, Dora Bakayanis, um, who, as I mentioned, has perhaps among this panel the most practical experience with regard to managing a, a large international uh, major sporting event. Uh, as the mayor of Athens in 2004, she of course hosted uh, the world's premier major sporting event, uh, and in her case, in this instance, 2004, the first such event after the tragedy of 9-11. Uh, so, um, so Madam Mayor, if, if I may um, address you, um, what do you take from your experience and what does it mean for a city or a nation uh, to host such an event under a totally new and unexpected, unplanned for security environment, uh, like the environment just after 9-11? Well, thank you, Douglas, and uh, hello to everybody. Uh, it was a very big challenge for us. Greeks uh, was the first country to organize uh, Olympic Games after 9-11. We are a small country with not unlimited funds. As you understand, uh, it was really um, very big for us. It was very big economically because uh, we had not planned uh, 1 billion, uh, 1.3 billion uh, euros for security. But on the other side, we had also to adapt the whole spirit of the Olympic Games to the security measures which were needed. So it was really a great challenge. We worked very hard on it. We worked very hard. We cooperated uh, with a lot of intelligence service around the world. We cooperated with a lot and we asked for technical assistance from a lot of friends around the world. Uh, we prepared the plan, uh, which was uh, the plan in case of a catastrophe, which of course did not happen, but also we had to adapt a lot of our uh, um, organizing projects for the city of Athens, which means that we had a lot of cultural events prepared, uh, they had to change, uh, which means we did not have any big events, uh, that we, we did not uh, fill the Athens Panathinaikon Stadium with people and having a cultural event, but we had events all around the city, smaller events. Smaller events are more easily controlled. In smaller events, if something happens, it cannot be as damaging as in big events. So that was the first decision we had to make. The second was that we really asked all people to cooperate on that issue. And it was, Douglas, amazing. The taxi drivers of Athens felt responsible, each one of them, for the security and the success of the Olympic Games. 
the people in Athens, the people who welcomed in many different languages, all the, uh, the visitors and the athletes felt responsible for the security of the games. So practically we involved the whole society of Athens in this effort. And I think that was extremely successful because honestly, I had a lot, a lot to deal with, with uh, the press at the beginning, because they looked a little bit down to us. They said, okay, Athens, uh, what will the Greeks do? The Greeks are never ready. The Greeks are not well organized. You know, uh, our fame was not the best in the world, but we managed. And uh, practically everybody was surprised uh, that we managed uh, so well. And I think that part of it was the organization, part of it was really the people who really wanted the Athens Olympic Games to be a success. Last but not least, we in ancient Greece, as you know, we invented the games, but we didn't only invent the games. We invented also a world called Echechiria. Echechiria means uh, that seven days before the Olympic Games, and seven, until seven days after the Olympic Games, the wars stopped in ancient Greece. And they stopped so that, first of all, the athletes could go to the event. They stopped also because they knew that the different athletes from different cities at the time, from different countries today, would meet. And it was a way, instead of war, to have a dialogue and a rapprochement between the two cities. So this is the Echechiria of the Olympic Games. And this was very clear in Athens. I saw in front of the city hall of Athens, Palestinians, Israelis, Arabs, different Arabs, um, Europeans, Americans and Russians dancing the same Sirtaki dance with a lot of understanding to, for, for each other. And this is the magic of, of uh, big sporting events. This is a magic people who are not active in sports, uh, but who can understand and can look at it, that you can feel proud if I see the Turkish flag because the, the athlete who won the, uh, the medal was worth it. So you understand, this is another spirit. So I've been a minister of foreign affairs for years. Let me tell you, the success of bringing people together in the Olympic games was much bigger than anything which I could do later as a minister of foreign affairs. Well, thank you for that. That the vignette of the, uh, the multinational dancing uh, in front of the city hall is is a perfect vignette that captures the, as you say, the magic uh, or the convening power uh, of uh, major sporting events. And that's really what this conference and what ICSS is is really all about. Um, let me turn to uh, Antonia Marie de Mayo, who runs the UN um, the UN ICRI um, and has been involved for more than a decade now. Uh, in terms of, um, of programs for securing major events. Um, uh, Antonia, most of the work to date has been done with regard to providing security against man-made threats, and most prominently, like the Athens Olympics, uh, terrorism. Um, but today, in the midst of this COVID pandemic, um, I wonder if the lessons from the last decade or so can be applied to natural challenges, natural, not man-made events, like a pandemic, for example. Uh, and I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me to be part of the panel. And, and it's great to see all my panelists uh, on the screen. Um, I'm new to Unicri, but indeed uh, Unicri has been involved in supporting security planning of major sporting events for nearly two decades. 
Um, we started in the post 9-11 era uh, with preparations for the 2006 Winter Olympics in Turin, Italy, uh, where Unicree is headquartered and the pictures behind me is actually uh, our building here in Turin. Um, at that time, we were mainly supported by the government of Italy and also the municipality of Turin. But since then, really all member states have recognized the importance of security planning for major events. In 2006, uh, ECOSOC approved a resolution that gave Unicree the mandate to support member states in security planning of major events, including sporting events. And since then, Unicree has developed a security planning model that has been used in more than 70 countries around the world. 10 years ago, we published a handbook for public-private partnerships and expanded the work also to looking at the protection of tourism and also vulnerable targets. And our program today focuses on protection of crowded and public spaces, security planning for major sporting events, and also promotion of sport to prevent violent extremism. And what we see is that all of these things are really related. Um, in the last 20 years of activities, we have supported events that related to sporting events, but we've also supported political summits, international fairs and expositions, religious gatherings, and other kinds of mass public events. So the principles are easily applicable to other kinds of large gatherings. And I wanna just talk a little bit about some of the evolution of the threats. You talked about how the threats used to be man-made and now it's something different. Um, of course, when we started our work in 2002 after 9-11, the focus was on counterterrorism measures. And at that time, effective security was based upon sophisticated intelligence and early detection. And then in 2004, Facebook was launched. And in 2006, Twitter was launched. And in 2007, we had the iPhone. And what we realized during this period was that every spectator and every participant at a major sporting event had the power to interfere with carefully planned security measures. They could post pictures or news. It might be fake, it might be real. We weren't really sure. So social media has added a whole new layer of complexity for security planners, and that continues until today. Over time, we have learned how to assist law enforcement to develop specialized skills and techniques to address threats within the social media sphere. The next big thing that happened was sophisticated technologies, big data, and artificial intelligence. And that's happened over the course of the last decade. And these create new challenges for major security, uh, excuse me, major event security. In response, member states have developed complicated cybersecurity measures that require monitoring and lots of upgrades. And the reality is that even with no malicious acts at all, any interference that affects cyberspace or the energy sector, for example, a power cut for just a couple of minutes, can have severe repercussions on the overall organization of a major event and its security. Um, Unicree actually founded a center in AI, excuse me, a center in The Hague on AI and robotics in 2017. And we look into precisely this challenges uh, in The Hague. The latest chapter in this evolution of threats uh, has really come from biology. So we had the spread of the Zika epidemic during the 2016 Rio Olympics. And now we have the current COVID-19 pandemic. And this has reminded all of us quite dramatically um, that our lives and major events can be jeopardized by threats that exist in nature without any malicious intent. And they can be mitigated or accelerated based upon individual human behavior. Um, we have of course always followed the expertise of WHO on communicable diseases, and that's a really important part in the planning process. So what we can see is that the security threats have evolved and expanded. Uh, some are man-made, some are influenced by human behavior, some are beyond our control, at least initially. And we recommend that member states move away from a traditional security planning approach, which is usually handled by the Ministry of Security or Ministry of Interior, 
and that they instead embrace an integrated security planning approach with a whole of government approach that all the service providers, healthcare, fire, civil protection, intelligence, all need to be involved and play an active role in security planning and response. This ensures better coordination and a more efficient use of public resources, but more importantly, it results in a more comprehensive response to address the full range of threats and risks and mitigation measures. Um, my staff, uh, as we were talking about this, reminded me of a very famous African proverb, and I'm just gonna end with that because it fits what we're talking about. And it says, if you wanna go fast, go alone. But if you wanna go far, go together. And that's definitely true for security planning at major events. Thank you. Um, thanks, Antonia. Let me, let me just come back to you. you. You, in a very interesting way, outline what began as a project or a program against physical security threats, most prominently terrorism. But then you introduced, I, I thought in a very, uh, an interesting, intriguing way, the impact of technology. Uh, and now perhaps a third wave, right? Which is this sort of biological, the threat of pandemics. So here in the United States, major events, in fact, I think we can cite even this conference today, have adapted to this third wave, the biological challenge, by way of virtual activities like today's conference. But in case of major sporting events, in many cases, we're still in the very early days of adapting. And that adaptation has been rather draconian. You know, it's essentially no spectators. So we're having uh, our National Football League, for example, is, uh, is playing largely without spectators. Uh, and, and so the initial response has been rather drastic. Uh, do you imagine, given the earlier adaptations, that the adaptations to this wave, the biological pandemic wave, will eventually adapt and move us back towards something less severe? I do, and the reason I expect that is because we also see the benefits of the sporting events. We know that these sporting events promote social cohesion. I think Madame Mayer said it better than anybody could, um, that seeing those flags together, seeing the Palestinians and the Israelis and people from all over the world unite together in sporting events, the power of the social cohesion is so important that we will want to find a solution. I think the public will rise up and want to find a solution, but also we who are promoting member states and governments and global peace, we want to find a solution because we can't lose a platform that is as powerful as sporting events to promoting social cohesion. Um, we have a lot of lessons that we can learn from these vast kinds of threats where we are going to be able to come together and formulate something that will work. The threats have adapted, but we can also adapt. So I'm really confident that we're gonna get there so that we don't lose the benefits of sporting events uh, for social cohesion. And we're still able to, to provide the security that's necessary. Uh, thanks. I think it's important for us all to appreciate that we are in the very early days and really only days of adaptation to this third, third wave if, if we can. Um, Vladimir, I'd like to come back to you. So you have a broad perspective of, of this challenge. And I'm wondering um, about your thoughts on the, the applicability of major sporting events and the security of major sporting events to a broader arena. So what can we take from major sporting events as a model for international security? Uh, can, we, can we translate from the microcosm to the larger case? I you think you're still on mute, Vladimir. There you go. So indeed, providing a safe and secure experience for major sporting events, it's critical to make it more difficult for terrorists to carry out attacks. Uh, but contribution of major sporting events to peace and security doesn't stop there. Sporting events remind us of our share, shared human values and strengthen community cohesion. And Douglas, you started 
uh, your uh, introductory remarks with this very important issue. You know, uh, I think sport is a unique platform for security services to work very closely together. Uh, I remember that during uh, the World Cup in Moscow, it was absolutely harmonious cooperation of different security forces from all around the globe working as a one. And I think it's a very good example that even uh, so delicate, uh, so, you know, so restricted in action services are able to work together when there is a need uh, to work together. You mentioned also this pandemic. I think uh, still there is a big challenge for the international community, speaking about security issues, including uh, security of sporting events, because virus is very strong against any kind of public activity. So I think we need to find a good recipe how to work together. Still, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, lack of trust is prevailing at this very moment. But sporting events, uh, it's something like a step-by-step -step approach to uh, recreate trust and confidence across the globe. And security of sporting events is a core issue for this uh, re-establishment of trust and confidence. So I think it will be very important tool in future in the in the next days, I think, in order to find the right answer to these questions and the challenges uh, appeared starting from this pandemic. So I think uh, it's, it's, it's very important to use these tools of sports and uh, uh, security of sport events as a tool which could unite better different countries and overcome the current misperceptions and misunderstanding. So I think it's it's very important to, to, to proceed this way. You know, that sort of rebuilding of trust and maybe public confidence may be especially important in the coming months and, and frankly years um, as we come out of this pandemic and as we contend with the next phase of dealing with the pandemic, uh, which of course is the, the vaccine the vaccine period, which is now just in its opening days. Um, Dora, let me return to you. you. You commented on the cost of securing the 2004 uh, Olympics in Athens. Now, what's the legacy of that cost? I mean, are, 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 is the cost so high that it might actually impede the hosting of future events? Or how did, how did you and your city, your country, contend with those rising costs, uh, which could really become a, an obstacle? Well, uh, let me tell you that the legacy of the Olympic Games uh, in Athens is very big. So our society gained from this legacy. First of all, the infrastructure we were, which was prepared, the metro, the roads, the airport, there were a lot of infrastructure, which probably would take many years to come to be finished. But due to the Olympic Games, it finished uh, and it finished uh, successfully in time. So this legacy is very big. Of course, the, the sporting infrastructure also. What I was talking about was the concrete cost of the security measures the security measures were very high. So that's why I believe that at the end, one should see and should look into uh, having a co, um, having an arrangement where also the, the, the cost is divided between the hosting country and the organization itself, because it can become quite big. Greece paid for it, it's finished. But in the future, very big events like the Olympic Games will uh, be quite difficult to be organized by smaller countries, and they should be able to be organized by smaller countries and by not so healthy economies. 
because this is the main idea. The main idea is not that the Olympic Games are organized by the United States, uh, Russia, France, uh, Britain, and Australia, and China. I mean, it should be possible also for smaller countries to take this kind of responsibility. So that's why I said that this cost has to, uh, the, has to be a participation for this cost, the security cost, not the infrastructure cost, but the security cost also from the organizers themselves. Now, let me get back to what Antonia said, because I believe that she is absolutely right. If you want to secure a big event, you have to have an integrated approach. I'm happy that I, we organized the Olympic Games before the iPhone and the Twitter. So we did not face this kind of problem. But yes, we had an integrated approach. Everybody was involved. If you want to have a plan, you have to have a plan for how the hospitals will work, what will you will do in case of, of, of an emergency, if you have dead people, where you will bring them, what does the fire department do, etc. So you have a central plan. And this was for us very important. That's why we had also two, uh, two different um, offices so that, it, that we did not face the problem Giuliani faced when his own emergency center was destroyed. We had an emergency center and practically a second one, so a fallback emergency center in case something would happen. Uh, what I mean is you need, you need an integrated plan, but let me finish politically. We are not ready as a generation to give up uh, sporting events, big conferences, meetings due to the pandemic. We faced the pandemic, we will face it um, also with uh, uh, now positive volume with the vaccines, with uh, the new medicines, but we will not give up because if our, the generation before us did not give up after the pandemic uh, in 1918, it would be at least ridiculous for us to live in the fear of a pandemic and change completely our way to connect to each other in the whole world. And we are connecting through sport events, we are connecting through big conferences, we are connecting through congresses, we are connecting and traveling. And this is something that I believe very clearly must be said, at least me as a politician, I'm saying it very openly, we are not ready to give it up and we will not give it up. Well, that's a very strong um, and clear statement. Um, frankly, it goes right to the mission of the International Center for Securing Sport because uh, we believe uh, in ICSS that sport is a model for cooperation across boundaries um, and can be used uh, uh, as a helpful model uh, in broader and different settings. Um, Antonia, um, let me return to you. Uh, and I, I was intrigued by your point that providing security by a host, say a host nation, involves not only international cooperation, but cooperation within that country, uh, within that host. Um, and this is cooperation that governments, national governments, regional governments, often find very difficult. In fact, you can argue that cross-boundary cooperation is one of the challenges of governance itself. So, uh, what uh, some of... Sorry, Dora. So, so no, no, we're sorry, still on. Sorry. That's okay. It's okay. It's one of the one of the hazards of the pandemic, right? So we, we all we all live this. Um, but Antonia, what what are the lessons that we can take from um, Unicree's work? about how to promote this cross-boundary cooperation, which governments may not find uh, very natural. Great, thank you for your question. Um, and, you know, coordination is, is at the heart of a lot of the work that the UN does, and certainly at the heart of some of the UN reforms. So I really appreciate this question to be able to highlight the importance of, of coordination. Um, the, 
Planning a major event is an opportunity for member states. Um, it's not only a challenge, but it's an opportunity for member states to review their security standards and their practices and to upgrade them to meet the threats. And in order to do this requires an iterative process where you're constantly learning and you have new information and new adaptation and you feed that back into the loop in order to inform your future practices. The UN Global Program provides an excellent umbrella to draw together all of the experience and expertise that's needed for this iterative process. And it then provides member states with a wide range of knowledge and tools to draw upon as they undertake the major events security planning. And that would include the upgrading of their own security standards and practices for the future. Um, and again, I, I, I thought that the comments um, from Madame Mayer were very interesting because she made the difference between the infrastructure and the security itself. And I think there's learning and lessons that are needed on both sides. So it benefits your national interest, but it benefits also you as a host of the event. Um, proper international coordination would facilitate things like the exchange of best practices and expertise. Um, it would facilitate the exchange of relevant information about security threats and risks and intelligence information. It would also exchange experience about the effectiveness of certain mitigation measures, because we're in a phase where we're gonna try different things. Some things are gonna work, some things aren't. We wanna learn from all of those experiences. And of course, there would be resource sharing, such as sharing of human resources, but also sharing of specialized equipment or technology. Um, we leverage, Unicree leverages our extensive experience in the field through the UN Global Program. So we are able to bring our experience at, through the Global Program and that can assist member states. And some of the areas maybe are of interest. So for example, uh, we can assess and reform law enforcement governance structures. We can also look at integrated multi stakeholder security planning, applying this whole of government approach, which I was talking about before. Um, but we also wanna look at issues like accountability, efficiency, gender empowerment, and even workplace conditions for law enforcement and security officers can definitely impact the final security that's offered. We wanna look at allocation and use of technology to assist security and law enforcement and strengthen the communication mechanisms between law enforcement and the local community. And lastly, to look at partnerships with private sector. So we can bring expertise and experience in all of those areas to member states as we look at how the major event security is done. And lastly, I wanna mention that the global program is facilitating the appointment of national focal points and also establishing a regional coordination platform and through this, member states can enhance their own bilateral and multilateral coordination as well. Um, so international coordination is exactly the way that we can keep major event security relevant and sustainable because it allows us to work together in this evolving and adaptable um, environment that we're in of changing security threats. Thanks. You know, as I've worked with ICSS, I've been very attracted to this model of the convening power of major sporting events. And this goes back to Doors' image of, you know, multinational convening power of the Olympics. Um, but I'm attracted today to, to this broader point, that it can also serve an as an example of cooperation. Cooperation across government boundaries, right, or within governments, but also uh, among nations. Um, and this is, uh, I think, very interesting because we face a challenge now with the pandemic um, where international cooperation and cross-government cooperation will be vital to our response now as we enter the vaccine stage of, uh, of the pandemic response. Um, and quite candidly, my experience in the U.S. government and even my experience in the U.S. military um, reminds me of the challenges. Uh, of uh, cross-government or cross-agency coordination. Uh, and this really, I think, comes to the heart of the, heart of, um, uh, the challenge in front of us, uh, much broader than uh, just major, major sporting events. Uh, Vladimir, um, back to you. So your office in particular deals with uh, member states 
and the challenges with violent extremism. Um, how can, is there, is there a role here for major sporting events to, to help in that particular field, the, perhaps the, the field where uh, physical security against violent extremism is most severe? Uh, it's a very good question, Douglas. Thank you very much. But first of all, about coordination. I think it's absolutely key issue in every kind of uh, human, human activity, especially now. Uh, we did establish in uh, the United Nations a global uh, coordination compact, which consists of 43 entities doing a different shades of counterterrorism and uh, prevention of violent extremism. Uh, Unicri is a part of this uh, arrangement, by the way, and we are working very closely with Unicri, not only on uh, security of sporting events, but on many other issues as well. So it uh, creates a very good spirit of common action, and it creates also an opportunity uh, to get together different actors uh, to uh, be in line with common programmatic activities. So it's, it's very important. Secondly, you mentioned the issue of bioterrorism as a possible threat for the next period of time. And this is a really very important issue because if we are speaking about medical infrastructure in many places of the world, one can say that it was not very well prepared uh, to address this COVID-19 pandemic. And I think it creates, we need to be vigilant in this regard. We need to find the right answer on this possible bioterrorism threat and I think it's one of the tasks for the next period of time. But speaking about prevention of violent extremism and sport, uh, I can say that uniqueness of our sport and prevention of violent extremism program is the interlinkage between the protection of major sporting events and the opportunity they offer to leverage the values of sport to achieve prevention of violent extremism goals. Let me explain. These events are a great opportunity to address a global audience with clear prevention of violent extremist messaging, leveraging on sport values such as tolerance, respect, integrity, solidarity, equality, and care. And we are developing a global campaign involving the participation of world famous athletes and youth to this end, which we expect will gain significant exposure during upcoming major sporting events, including the Tokyo Olympics. We hope that uh, this Olympic Games will take place next year. The 2022 FIFA World Cup in Qatar and the 2021 Africa Cup, Cup of Nations. Uh, these events also offer an opportunity to promote the participation of youth and children in sports as a recreational activity. This helps children and youth build transferable skills such as confidence, self-control, and teamwork, while at the same time serving as a positive means to release stress. Sport events also allow children and youth to connect and identify with positive adult role models. In some, sport has the potential to be a powerful tool in our efforts to prevent violent extremism, which is precisely what our sports program seeks to unlock. And I would like to praise the role of ICSS has been playing in our efforts as a critical partner of our program. You know, I'm, I'm um, attracted to this idea that the calendar of upcoming major sporting events. So you mentioned Tokyo, um, the Tokyo Summer Olympics, which were postponed by a year and now will be the summer of uh, 2021. So just six months off, right? Um, not far behind that uh, are the scheduled Winter Olympics in Beijing in uh, early 2022. And then you mentioned the, uh, the World Cup in Qatar uh, in the summer of 2022. And I, I wonder if 
as, as this panel looks forward, um, whether those sort of three events, those three milestone events might serve as examples of the world coming back together uh, after a period where arguably the pandemic has divided us. Uh, Dora, what, do, what does this upcoming set of three events, what does it mean for your successors, the, the hosts of those three events? And is it possible, can you imagine that the combination of Tokyo, Beijing, Doha uh, could actually help the world come together in a way post pandemic uh, that is very healthy and, and, um, and promotes, promotes cooperation? Well, I think that uh, it is a big opportunity. The Tokyo Olympic Games, which are the first, uh, it's a great opportunity for all those uh, who are exactly thinking of the preparation to really try to have an international agreement of how these games will be really possible. For example, will the hosts ask um, uh, for a vaccine? Are they, uh, there are a lot of moral questions here. So as a member of Council of Europe, we have to deal with it in the next six months. So are you allowed to ask for a vaccine before you allow people to attend the games? Which means that I will probably attend the games. Will I be obliged by the hosts to have a vaccine before? First question. Second question. Are you allowed to ask the athletes to be vaccinated? Probably not. If the athletes are not vaccinated, how many tests and how much testing will be going on every day in Tokyo during the games? Which is also an open question. Third, do you have the infrastructure in Tokyo, the, 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 uh, the hospital infrastructure to really go out to the world and say, okay, in case I have taken all these measures, but in case something happens, yes, I have at least the infrastructure for so and so and so. So the Tokyo games are really the test, in my opinion. If the Tokyo games win, and I have a big trust in the Japanese organization, if the Japanese really and with the help of everybody, of course, because there you have an international agreement. Uh, Greece must agree how we will send over our people. Uh, the United States have to agree how they will send over uh, their people, etc. So we have, if the Tokyo um, uh, Games find the know-how and we agree on the roadmap, which we have to follow, then the other games are much, much easier to, to conduct because they will have a ready recipe. Third, yes, in my opinion, the summer 2021 will be the mark of the coming back to normal life. That's why the game, the Olympic Games in Tokyo are so important because the whole world will see normality hopefully, we'll see the stadiums full of people, we'll see the athletes, and the whole, um, this um, depression which the world feels will be uh, left behind. So the, in my opinion, we have to do whatever is possible to help the Japanese succeed in this extremely big and challenging endeavor. Thanks, Dora. Uh, and back to Antonia for um, for a last uh, a last comment. Um, Antonia, do you feel that based on the experience of the last ten years, um, that the next ten years um, feature an opportunity for sport to serve as the same sort of model that uh, Vladimir and Dora just suggested? So, can uh, Tokyo 21, 
uh, Beijing Winter 22, World Cup Doha Summer 22. Can they be the milestones that really move us forward? Um, and, and, and then I think we'll conclude with, with your thoughts. Great, thank you. Um, I certainly agree with Vladimir and with Dora. I think this is an incredible opportunity um, for everyone to come together. Um, and I think that it really draws on all the principles that we've been talking about throughout this hour. Um, it draws upon our ability to coordinate, uh, to support each other, to apply all the lessons learned. I mean, this is why this global program is so important um, to build on the 20 years and the experience to bring together. Uh, I also think that it, it creates uh, an opportunity for us to have the wider discussion about how do we balance security measures with human rights. Uh, and again, these are principles that are not new. Uh, we know that there are tensions, uh, particularly at challenging times when we're trying to address very, very complicated concerns. Uh, but again, the United Nations can really serve as uh, the model for this because we know that we need to put the principles of human rights, rule of law, and equality at the center of everything that we're doing. Um, and governments will be able to better serve their people, and they will be able to improve the overall security context when we bring all of these principles together. So I, I completely agree with the other speakers, the other panelists, and I think that together we bring the experience and we try our best to make this coming period, um, the successful mark as we move forward. If for whatever chance, uh, the science and the medicine isn't ready for that, we will have another future opportunity. If it gets delayed a couple of months, it gets a delayed a couple of months, but for the political, the social, the moral reasons that we've been talking about today, the marker will come and we will draw on all of the exp ex experience and lessons learned in order to make it a success. Thank you. Well, well, thanks very much. As we draw to a close here in the top of the hour, I just want to thank um, for her opening comments, uh, Ms. Markovich, but also for the three panelists here who have been very candid and I think thoughtful about the power of major sporting events as an example, as the model uh, for uh, cooperation. Uh, I drew personally some lessons from this conversation and most important, I think for personally, if I can share my notes, uh, would be that major sporting events serve as a laboratory for cooperation within governments, within the host governments, across governments, so in the international effort, and even as a laboratory for multinational organizations as large and as comprehensive as the United Nations. So in that way, uh, I think um, ICI, ICSS uh, and its mandate, its mission, um, to try to promote this model of security for multi, for large um, uh, large sporting events uh, is is right on the mark. It's on target uh, in terms of the power of the example. So again, let me thank uh, each of the panelists uh, and ICSS, uh, the organizer, the convening uh, authority of this uh, conference, and uh, turn back over to uh, to our hosts.